In that case, we will call this meeting to order and welcome everybody to the November 2023 Ward 6 NPA. Uh, my name is Dale Azaria. I am one of the Ward 6 NPA steering committees. We are a group of volunteers who um, help to organize these meetings. Uh, I am the only member of the steering committee who is here in person, but uh, a couple of our other steering committee members are on the Zoom. Um, Anita just said hello, and uh, one of our other steering committee members, uh, Mills Forney, is here as well. Um, it would be great if we can start by just introducing ourselves um, so that we all know who's here in the room. Uh, anybody who would prefer not to introduce themselves is welcome to pass, of course. Um, but um, but I think it's just nice if we know who we're sitting here with, both in the room and online. Um, maybe we can just kind of go down the table this way and then snake back around. Uh, if you wouldn't mind going first. Good evening. I'm Michael Lachance. I'm the fire chief. My name is Sarah Hernandez Tim. I'm the public information officer for the Burlington Police Department. I'm Judy Barber, a resident of Robinson Parkway. Brian Jarrett, Robinson Parkway. How about if we go all the way up there to the front of the room? Hi, Scott Rogers, Community Development Manager of CEDA. I'm Paul Skyman, NPA Public Engagement Coordinator. I'm Scott Pavic, Substance Use Policy Analyst for the city. Victor Prusak, I'm here as a Ward City resident and for the Bronson School District. June Brown, I'm a resident. I live on Climber Street. Uh, Ethan Fleming, I'm with the University of Vermont Student Government Association. I'm Charlotte Dillon, I'm my resident. And over here? I'm Nick Anderson, I'm uh, the AVP of Planning at Champlain College, so I'm your host tonight and can help if you've got any questions. Um, just quickly, I'll go back a bit closer. Um, for the reference, uh, fire escape is straight that way or out this way, two different ways, or down the end of the hall and out. Um, there's bathrooms right beside, um, just outside the door here. And uh, yeah, feel free to ask if you've got other questions about what where the things are in the facility. And Charlie, I don't know if you want to introduce yourself from behind the camera. Yeah, I'm Charlie G from Town Meeting Television. Thank you. Excellent. Um, and is there anybody online who would like to introduce themselves? Um, I think that if you want to speak, do, you, do they need to change from being a panelist or can they just be called on? Oh, Alan. Yeah, I'm yeah. Alan Matson, Ward 6 resident. Um, sorry, not in person, not feeling too well tonight. And my husband also, but he didn't feel like saying that in any official capacity. Um, Connie. <laughs> Hi, I'm Connie Crosney. Um, I can't seem to get a video to work, so I, I don't know whether we're doing that or not. I live in Ward 6, and I'm glad to be here. Thanks, Connie. Um, we had a couple more people walk into the room. Um, oh, well, first, we'll, we'll stay online for a second. Rebecca. I'm Becky Lavasser. I'm a Ward 6 resident. Nice to have you. And we had a couple more folks walk into the room. If you don't mind introducing yourselves. I'm Henry Severance, Ward 6 resident. Jack Evans, also Ward 6. Terrific to have folks here. Thank you very much. Um, so we start these meetings with um, any public comments or announcements that folks would like to name, make. Uh, you're welcome to share your news, your events, your questions, um, and your concerns. Great. Well, I would like to extend an invitation to each of you to the Burlington Police Department's Community Academy. The Community Academy is a hands-on opportunity to learn about BPD and interact with our officers and staff. The Community Academy is open to those 18 years or older and uh, those who live in or work in Burlington. Um, it will take place every Wednesday evening from 6 to 9 p.m. starting January 3rd through February 7th at the Burlington Police Department uh, in our community room on Little North Avenue. Um, applications are due by December 15th, and I have brought with me flyers today with additional information um, here, and I can um, I also have provided these to our steering committee members as well. 
And um, we can uh, link to a copy of this information in our notes from today's meeting to make it available. But also for those who didn't get a paper copy of this and would like, um, there's a couple more sitting on the table over there where nobody is sitting. So please feel free to grab one if you're interested. Um, any other uh, public comments or announcements? From anybody online? Okay, um, Bosca, were you able to bring those little yeah. survey questions? So um, one thing that we as the steering committee always want to know is um, what people would like to get out of these meetings. Um, clearly tonight we've got an important topic and sometimes those topics are sort of obvious. Sometimes um, people contact us and say that they have something that they'd like to, to present. And those can be um, folks who work for the city or folks who represent us um, or uh, whoever it is. So we sometimes get requests from people who would like to present to the Word 6 MPA, but we would really like to know um, what, if anything, uh, folks would like to hear about and how folks would like to use this meeting time. So we put together this short little questionnaire that anybody is welcome to fill out. If anybody didn't come with pen or pencil, because these days we just use our laptops and our phones and whatever else, I do have a pen that I am happy to share. Um, and maybe Nick is over there digging for extra because He's got everything that anyone would ever need to hold a meeting. Um, so uh, if anybody's got any suggestions that they want to offer up out loud, that would also be terrific. Do you want to tell the people online they can access your Google form on the agenda? And I will tell the people online that they can access the Google form that asks a very similar set of questions on the agenda, Alan, you've got your answer. Thanks for asking. Um, and yeah, you can access it on the agenda and um, probably wherever you found this Zoom link, you can probably find it there too. <laughs> I thought I emailed it to you, I'm sorry. Um, so, um, we, uh, if we are done with announcements and public forum, we just have a single agenda item for tonight, and it's clearly one that has stirred up a lot of interest based on the fact that we've got a bunch of people here, um, which is always great. Um, and, uh, as we read in the papers, um, the Burlington City Council, um, declared um, that uh, uh, the, the drug crisis is a major public health issue and um, is um, initiating efforts to address that. And uh, we invited um, folks from the city council, from the police department, from the fire department, from the school district, and uh, from CEDO, the city's um, substance abuse policy. policy analyst, thank you, um, to uh, give us an idea of what this means, what's happening, um, what we should know, and what we can do. Um, we had a feeling that there'd be a lot of questions. I, I should add that um, I, Police Chief John Murad let me know that he will be here as soon as he can. He's got to take care of his kids and expected that he would be able to get here at about 7.15. So we'll be able to hear from him then. And maybe in the meantime, you can keep track of questions and relay them to him um, when he gets here or after, or maybe there's things that you know about and can answer. Um, uh, Joan Shannon, one of our city council representatives, let me know that she was not going to be able to make this evening's meeting. She has a um, Mills, welcome, come on in. Hello. Uh, 
Uh, Joan has a conflicting um, city council ordinance with the meeting tonight. So she's not able to be here. We're expecting Karen Paul. Um, so hopefully she'll get here at any moment. Um, but in the meantime, um, would love to hear from um, Chief Lachance um, and from Scott Pavick and from the school district um, to perhaps get us started. And uh, we don't have a particular order here. What we asked the participants to do was just make some introductory comments, let us know what they thought was important, and then pretty quickly move to questions and discussion um, because that's what so often we don't get a chance to do. We can read the news, but we don't often get a chance to, to interact with the folks who are implementing these policies. Sure. Yeah. Okay. You sure. sure. I do. I did create a little presentation. Um, I'm unable to connect to the Zoom, but I did email it to you. Okay. And maybe if you can connect it. So to would me, I be able to share my screen? Could be able. Yeah. Okay. Let me get this open then. Uh, Um, maybe you can just start it. Okay. okay. A little, That's I will okay. get it up as soon as I can. So as I introduce myself, my name is Michael Chance. I'm the fire chief of Burlington Fire Department. And um, <clears throat> as you guys have seen in the news recently, we have implemented a new service in the city. Um, it's been, we're in our third week now. Um, it's the community response team and it is two uh, firefighter EMTs um, in a city vehicle, a city pickup truck, um, or a fire department pickup truck, kind of going around, and they're they're running unresponsives. Uh, anything that comes in with unresponsive or overdose, they are uh, taking that run, and they're also doing um, community outreach and com community engagement um, activities as well. So they're not just responding to emergencies, they're also in the in the field working with folks directly and um working to try to find solutions for them where they are so um we are connecting with partners like the turning point center um our our police department uh csls are a, an excellent resource for us um the the uh community health center um, just all, all these different agencies, you know, we go out, we make contact, and based on needs, um, we, we just try to find solutions for folks. Um, we are, again, responding to calls for unresponsive folks. Uh, every unresponsive person is not an overdose. Uh, we had one day back about a month ago, we had... 50 some unresponsive folks, eight of them were overdoses. The rest were um, people um, feeling the effect of their of their drug, or they were sleeping maybe, or they were <clears throat> just not in crisis. So um, this, this team is actually going out and they are able to run these calls. If there is a crisis, if they are overdosed, or if they do have any kind of medical emergency, uh, this team are all advanced providers. They do have defibrillators. They have Narcan. They have everything that they get, that they need to uh, begin care if they need to. Um, but they uh, are basically able to be out there, get to this, get to the patients really quickly, and assess. And if the person doesn't need services beyond that assessment, you know, we're, we are reducing unit movements for the fire trucks and the ambulances, allowing them to be in service for more more acute emergencies. So this, you mind if I just uh, oh, go right ahead? Thank you very much. Thank you. Right now, it is. It's not the first slide. That was that's the first slide, okay. and that's one. There we go. All right. Expect. So uh, this this. PowerPoint presentation is actually just an update. I updated it as of the 31st of October. Um, this first slide just shows total responses for the fire department. As you can see, we already uh, surpassed 
uh, totals from 2021. We're creeping up on totals from 22, and we're looking at a one-year total response increase of 14%. These slides are interesting. Overdose totals transported versus non-transported. And as you can see, the, the blue is uh, overdoses or total overdoses. The orange is uh, the folks that we transport and the gray is folks that we don't transport. And you can see that, um, that increase year to year. Um, some folks wonder why do we not transport people if they are overdosed? Well, some, some of those folks are, uh, the overdose is, is uh, converted before we get there. Some of them, we convert that overdose with, or with uh, Narcan, but the patients after you give the Narcan are alert and oriented. So they, if they don't desire to go to the hospital, we can't kidnap them to bring them. So, um, so they don't go. So as you can see, there is a, a bit of an uptick in folks that choose not to go, um, but quite a few still do. Um, and you can just see that that monthly overdose responses uh, average. And it, if you could see last month's, it's actually gone down. Um, one thing that I noted today running numbers is the month of October had the fewest overdoses that we saw since September of 2022. So that's encouraging for sure. So you can see that monthly overdose chart and you can see how September was really high and then October dropped off pretty pretty considerably. Um, so that again, it's one month, it's not a trend, but it is encouraging. So again, those calls for the dispatches of unknown problem or person down, that's where that CRT is coming in. Um, and you can see those call numbers have been pretty steady over the years and then in the last couple of years have gone up pretty considerably. Uh, that 510 is what's the expected for this year. And then some folks are like, well, how much of this is alcohol? And as you can see, the alcohol intoxication calls for that call type are pretty steady. I mean, they're not, they're not, uh, they're not what's causing our increase. Uh, the homeless, houseless, transient, and no address population. This is a population that uh, I'm focusing on a little bit just to see you know, where are we with, with these folks. Um, they are a high risk population. Of course, now that it's getting colder out, um, they're high, higher risk. Um, the city is working to stand up a warming shelter, I believe beginning the, in December. So that's encouraging. Um, but you, know, you can see that, that 2022 and 2023, we're seeing pretty significant increases on the chart below, you can see that light blue, that's 2023. So it's pretty consistent month over month increases over the last number of years prior to. And again, it's just another way of looking at it. Uh, it did go down a little bit in the month of October, but it's still, as you can see here, fairly st steady increase over previous years. And a lot of these patients are, are high risk patients. They do suffer from substance abuse or mental health issues. and. And, um, you know, if we are dealing with these folks in the public, they are folks that sometimes just don't have, don't really want to work with us. Um, so it's kind of one of those, we keep trying, they keep saying no, and then we, we just hope that, that we are able to reach them where they are. This is responses to overdose throughout the city. And as you can see, there are areas that are definitely a higher higher density city hall park things like that but it, you know it is a, it is an issue throughout the city and this is overdose responses hour by day and day of week and again it, it it's mostly midday or those really heavy midday to evening but it's sunday through saturday um pretty consistently so so that's that's it that's uh my my little presentation um I think I've spoken long enough. I'm happy to answer any questions. <clears throat> um, I, I'm going to suggest if anybody has any really specific questions about the data that you just presented, that would be fine. Otherwise, I'd like to go through all of the introductory remarks so that then questions can be directed to not just one person, but to the whole group. But if anybody's got a real specific question about what was just presented, 
not seeing anybody. That was Vera, thank you. <laughs> and just to, to introduce the last person to walk oh, yes. into the room, what's that? Uh, oh, yeah, yeah, thank you very much. I'm Mills Forney, I'm also a member of the steering committee. Apologies for being late. I have two very young kids, and uh, that time was a struggle. <laughs> but I'm glad to be here. Welcome. I have a specific thing about when you mentioned there was a decline in October. Yeah. Do you have any, like, is there like an explanation? No, no. <laughs> <laughs> Honestly, there isn't an explanation. And, and here it is the first of November. So if there was an explanation, I probably wouldn't know it. Yeah. Um, all I did was draw that data out of our EMS um, reporting software and saw the raw numbers, uh, honestly, about two hours before this meeting. <laughs> so um, regarding reasons, I, yeah, I, I'd i like to dig into it more and see reasons. I think uh, I did send the data to the mayor's office and the, the police chief, you know, and maybe he is seeing some things on the street too that we can collaborate on and say, hey, we're noticing this. And I you know, he shared his data with me, and his data showed the same thing, a, a drop off in the month of October. So it was it was cons a consistent, you know, both departments saw that, and, and hopefully, you know, at future maybe ComStat meetings, or we can grab that and say, what was, what was the change? Yeah, so go ahead. Are there only two EMTs in from the department available for this new uh, initiative? No, we, we're we we're staffing this initiative with voluntary overtime. So we were able to stand it up in about three and a half weeks. And the only reason we could do that is because we didn't have to hire for it because we had overtime and we didn't have to buy it. We, we used a vehicle we already had. It's our plow vehicle, so if it snows, it'll be a trick. But, um, but I, if it snows, you say. <laughs> But I, I have, um, I, I, we've, we've had about 15, maybe 18 of our folks sign up for the, for staffing it. So uh, it's a pretty broad section of people, everything from advanced EMPs to paramedics. So. Scott, I wonder if you'd like to chime in at this point, let us know what it is that you're doing and seeing. Sure. Just Help us get started with this conversation. Yeah, I mean, I don't have much data for present. Usually the data I present uh, to the city involves Chief LaChance's data. So um, I can tell you who I am. Uh, Scott Boddock, Substance Use Policy Analyst for the city of Burlington. Been in this role for about two years or so. Um, I also represent Burlington on the Opioid Settlement Advisory Committee. Happy to talk about spending recommendations or allocations made thus far, if that comes up later in the meeting. I also represent... Uh, the city on the state's substance misuse prevention council so kind of both ends of the spectrum when thinking about prevention to recovery um other than that a lot of my work is standing up the mayor's monthly comsat forums that bring together local stakeholders to discuss um trends data observations that ought to be used to inform either community programming here in Burlington or advocacy for policy changes at the state level. Aside from that, I'm responsible for anything drug related in the city or anytime anyone has a question about drugs. So, um, Here's nice. <laughs> oh yeah. And, um, yeah, so I'm not busy. Um, and, uh, yeah, it's, uh, a lot of work. Um, thinking about some of the things that we're tackling here for ad hoc projects, looking at um, bringing a community syringe redemption pilot here to Burlington for a few days to deal with the um, problem of improperly discarded syringes that have been just exploding uh, around the city for the past few years, and looking at methadone expansion, um, access to treatment in partnership with the Howard Center Shedman Clinic. So those are two efforts that I would hope you would hear more about in the coming months. Um, can't say too much specific wise yet, but was excited to at least be able to speak the words here tonight um, that those efforts are underway. Um, but that's it for my intro. Thank you. Cool. Um, how about if we keep going around? Sure. Victor? Yep. Hi, I'm Victor Krutek. I'm the coordinator of the Office of Engagement for the district. Um, happen to live down the street. Um, so Tom Flanagan asked me to attend tonight. Um, don't have a presentation like Chief. <laughs> That's fine. We did. No, 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 no. I know. Just kidding. That was somebody, actually great to see. Just get extra credit. Try to move that. Yeah. Is that helpful? Okay. Um, 
from the school district perspective, you know, it's interesting. School districts usually, when we're talking about drugs, we're talking about drug use among our students. That, I mean, that's always a concern, but that is not our concern at all. What we're seeing um, particularly, actually almost all of our school sites, but particularly at um, our schools in the Old North End, um, downtown Edmonds Elementary, Edmonds Middle School, and our high school, of course, on Cherry Street, we are seeing and dealing with the impacts of the increased drug use for teaching. Um, and um, what that looks like are needles everywhere, kids being harassed, kids feeling uncomfortable on their way to and from school, particularly in any sort of alcoves of um, commercial type buildings or uh, Memorial Auditorium, uh, the walkway in between the Cherry Street Garage and the former Macy's. Um, in the garage, so that's pretty rare during the day, um, but it's definitely creating anxiety among our students. Um, we've seen a decrease in bike thefts. I'm not sure what that's about, if that's true across the city. Um, I have noticed that a lot of our high school kids are using really crappy locks and I'm shocked that their bikes aren't getting stolen because in 2021, all of those were stolen immediately. Um, so yeah, I mean, that, that's the big issue for us and why we were happy to engage in this conversation today. Thank you. Thank you for being here. Um, so just to catch everybody up, um, two of our other invited guests have shown up in the last couple of minutes and we are glad to have you here so you know what you missed um we heard from chief lachance um with a lot of um some information about their new program and some statistics about the increase year over year as well as a uh, um surprising and perhaps still unexplained decrease in october um, in the calls that they were getting. Uh, we heard from Scott Pavick about what he's doing and a couple of programs that he's excited will be starting soon. I think you both heard most of what Victor had to say about what's going on in the schools. And with that and without further ceremony, I want to um, invite, uh, maybe just by order of arrival, um, Chief Murad, I'll ask you if you want to just give us a little bit of introductory context and what we're doing is mostly holding questions, sure. but expecting that most of the time will be for questions and discussion. Gotcha. Um, but just want to hear what you think is important that we know to set the context for those questions. Sure, absolutely. So um, uh, I thank you very much for having me. I'm sorry that I was late. My daughter, Katie, is, uh, the, is in the Christmas tree lighting show, uh, the tree lighting show for uh, that happens after on the day after Thanksgiving. And so she's in rehearsal for that. Um, and I had to drop her off, uh, but uh, the, and so I'm sorry I wasn't able to be here right on time. Um, so, you know, I, obviously we're here because we're in a, a bit of a quandary with regard to public safety. We feel that public safety has slipped in the city. Uh, I think that uh, folks uh, feel that very keenly as they go about uh, the, their daily lives in our city. Uh, we are, with regard to objective measures, particularly around violence, insofar as violence is an indication of safety, better than we were last year. We experienced a terrible, terrible spate in gunfire last year. Uh, we experienced a, a history, a, a historic high for our city of murder. Uh, we had five in the year. We have never had that many. Um, and we are not seeing that this year. We had one very terrible murder uh, that was solved. We've had 10 gunfire incidents, and yet they are very different than the ones we saw last year. They, they are not following a pattern of involvement. Um, and very only two of them resulted in people being struck, which was very different than what we saw last year. Those are good things. 10 is still worse than we used to see. Uh, and so we are still working on that. I have deep concerns about where we may go with regard to that kind of violence based on the horrible incident that happened in Bristol uh, and the, uh, the, the homicide of a, of a young man, uh, not a student at our, in our schools here in, in Burlington, but someone that many uh, youth in Burlington knew um, and killed by another 14, a 14 year old boy killed by another 14 year old boy uh, who was a student in our school system. I have great concerns about where that's going with regard to some uh, a sense of, of uh, 
of turmoil that is going on among groups of young people over this act um, and some of the, the things that led to it. But insofar as our day-to-day -day and what everybody experiences in the downtown, it's primarily issues around the drug problem, which I, I'm certain that Chief Chance was able to articulate because they deal with it uh, day in and day out, just as police officers do. And that is also driven by a, a vast increase in the number of homeless that are in the city. Homelessness in and of itself is not a crime. And many of the people who experience homelessness don't commit crimes. They do, however, often create a sense of public disorder, even if they're not actually creating behavior that is, by law, disorderly. And that's simply because people feel less comfortable when there's large numbers of folks who are unhoused out in the public sphere. That's just a fact of how we feel. We feel empathy and pity, but we also sometimes feel a certain amount of fear and a certain amount of concern for our own safety. And that kind of uh, sensibility permeates everything that we do in our downtown and in our city core. So we are working on that. But the big issue when we talk about something like that, when we talk about a condition that is not unlawful, even if it can sometimes be a nexus for unlawful behavior, but it's a, a not unlawful condition that fills us with senses of, of lack of safety, how do we address something like that? Because we can't simply sweep folks off the streets. That's unlawful, it's immoral, it's not right, and frankly, we couldn't do it even if somehow that uh, was, was the mandate that was given. We don't have enough officers, we don't have enough places to, to put folks, um, and that's a big issue. We don't have enough housing for these people for, for these people who are are living in, in ways that, that that trouble us greatly. And that if you were to go to the encampments that, that I have been to or that officers have to go to, that are our, our community support liaisons and in-house social worker team that we've created to try to get at some of the uh, factors that cause these conditions and help people out of these conditions, uh, the places that they go to. You'd be astonished. It is not uh, a way that any of us would want to live. In. So what are we going to do about that? It is not merely a public safety answer. In fact, public safety may be one of the least uh, you know, important components of addressing it, even though it is the most important component when we come to addressing the actual acts that create a sense of, of unsafety, whether that's crime or whether that's violence or whether that's disorder that, that teeters towards that. And I know that you want to make most of this about questions. So I'll, I'll sort of leave it at that. But it is a, we are in the midst of a huge question, a huge period of question. Yeah. Thank you. Karen. Um, yes. Would you like to say some, some uh, introductory words? Um, I know that uh, this resolution uh, that the city council um, adopted um, was important to you and you wanted to you have to say about it. And um, and once we've done that, then we should open it up to a sure. general discussion. And I'll, and I'll, and I'll, try to be, I'll try to be brief about it. My apologies for not being here on time. I didn't have a daughter that was doing a tree <laughs> but I but I had a legitimate excuse, just not probably as good as yours, uh, Chief. Um, so yes, uh, we did on October 10th pass a resolution that had come through the Public Safety Committee. Um, in addition to serving as the council's council president, I did an unprecedented, rather unprecedented thing and, and uh, appointed myself chair of public safety because actually there weren't a lot of people who wanted to be on the public safety committee um, because it is a very active one and you can imagine why. Um, the, uh, the resolution that we passed um, was declaring the drug crisis an emergency and to be our top public safety and public health priority. Um, for the first time as council president in a year and a half, I, for the first time I passed the gavel um, to be able to introduce this resolution and speak to it because I felt that it was the most the most important resolution that we would pass all year. Um, you know, I think uh, the chief has spoken to, and I'm sure I'm sure the chief Lachance has also spoken to the fact that you know this is a this is a crisis of rather unprecedented proportion um, for a variety of reasons. And one of the things that Chief Murad spoke to is the number of people that are outside. Um, although many of them are not people that are actively um, uh, suffering from substance use disorder, there is a large number of people that are sleeping outside um, and have nowhere else to go. There's approximately, according to Sarah Russell, the special assistant to end homelessness, it's around 200 people in Chittenden County, many of which are in 
are in and around Burlington. Um, and each day they come out with a list of the number of rooms, motel rooms that are available um, uh, uh, by county. In Chittenden County, it is usually listed um, under the category of limited, which means less than 10 rooms are available. Um, for 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 housing people that are that are that are struggling on the street, so it's a, a huge problem. Um, very soon, as we all know, it's getting colder outside. Um, very soon, it will get much colder outside, and uh, this is a this is a a serious serious problem. Um, as far as the drug crisis goes. Um, you know what we had, what we determined, and what we what we put into the resolution. We'll set up community forums where people will come and talk and hear. We'll hear from uh, people about harm reduction. Uh, we will have the Chittenden County State's Attorney who will also be there. People from the schools, from law enforcement, to sort of learn about where we are with the drug crisis, and then to offer ideas and suggestions um, on how we can improve the situation that we have in our city. Uh, a lot of people very much want to talk about public safety, and this is gonna be an opportunity for all of us to get together and talk about public safety. It's the it's gonna be the 13th and 14th of December. Um, the lo we have the locations, but haven't confirmed the, the second location. So I can't, I, can't, I can't put those out there quite yet, um, but I think, I think that what I've heard from most people uh, that I've spoken with is that uh, there's no question that those who are suffering, that people in this community um, who see those that are suffering from substance use disorder, they want the people that are struggling to get well and to be safe. We all want to be safe. And I think that's, um, I think that is the, the, the really crux of the issue is that everybody wants to feel safe in, in this city. And that is the challenge that we have. And uh, um, part of the reason why we have the drug crisis resolution, this has to be our number one public health and public safety priority. So I will I will stop there so that you can ask questions, so people can ask questions. Okay. Um, I have a feeling there's gonna be a lot. How about, we'll just, we'll start in the room and take a few questions in the room. And then we do have like 10 or 12 people online. So we'll kind of flip back and forth, but. And if you could just start by introducing yourselves, because um, folks who, who came in late may not know who everybody sure. is. I, my name is Jim Brown. I'm a resident from Climber Street. Uh, my question is, has anyone, um, any group, any uh, organization done uh, some kind of a survey or census with the appropriate privacy considerations and all that to try to find out who the people are that are homeless, where they came from, what their story is? To come up with a better, or to try to come up with a, a better solution for what's happening, does that information exist? I don't want to speak to that. We do have that, but okay. whoever wants to, um, there there are surveys done, headcounts that that help us determine that. And has somebody gone and interviewed every single person and taken that down as data yes. in a way that, that collects it? No, not to my knowledge. I think the people who work most closely with these populations know many of these people quite intimately. Uh, and, and have helped them in some cases for, for years now. Um, and yet we also have a, a larger population than we've ever had. I mean, normally there were 40 to 50 people who were unhoused in the community in, in Burlington at any given time. That has quadrupled. And uh, there are a number of people who are relatively new who come in, street outreach. So every morning and every evening, we hold a roll call at the police department. That roll call includes members of the street outreach team, which is a component of Howard Center. It includes members of our community support liaison team who are in-house social workers employed by the Burlington Police Department. It includes members of our community service officer team who are unarmed, unsworn members of the department who enforce certain kinds of municipal codes, but don't have weapons and can't make arrests. And then of course it includes our officers who are going to be doing the response to crime calls and issues where, where safety is, is at stake. And those members team back about all this stuff. They try to talk about individuals in the community who are experiencing mental health crises, who have been, you know, either improving or, unfortunately, sometimes decompensating over the last several days. People with whom we've come into repeated contact in a short period of time. Uh, just today, we had to take a woman into emergency custody uh, via a an emergency evaluation order because we've had 
18 contacts with her since very late August, and this particular one involved uh, her going and, and threatening people in the public sphere, attempting to assault a neighbor, uh, making horrible statements towards parents and children leaving uh, schools along North Street. Um, and so she was taken into custody and taken for an emergency evaluation. So we team back about that kind of information. Uh, in the morning, it might be we worry about this individual. And then in the evening, roll call, it might be this happened today. And now these are things that we may be looking at. We know a lot of these individuals by story and by background and by repeated contact. Um, but what you're describing, no, I don't believe that that's been done. I think you, you just illustrated uh, a, a good point. There's so much activity and so much diversity, it's easy to get down a rabbit hole on all the details. Mm -hmm. I think it would be useful to have one person or one committee have all the data that can be collected to try to abstract some bigger picture uh, issues from this, <clears throat> to try to see if there's a clearer, less hazy picture that comes into view about how to go forward to solve the problem. That may be something that Sarah Russell either has or is working on, uh, but it's not something of which I know for sure. Okay, thank you. Sarah actually is working on documenting each person to the best of her ability on, um, you know, the people that obviously, as Chief Merritt has said, the people that are doing this work daily, you know a lot of the people that are, are in house, um, and she is making every effort to literally document each one of those people. So that effort is being made, but it is not an easy, it's an, as you say, it's a fluid and evolving situation. So it's not always incredibly easy, but that effort is being made. I'd also like to note that there's a very distinct uh, sort of separation in the unhoused population between those who are unhoused, sometimes for economic reasons or things that, that many of us in this world live very hand to mouth. And, and it doesn't take a lot to push somebody over a precipice into a situation of being unhoused. That is one sort of category of folks who are unhoused. Many of those folks do attempt to find housing in, in, the, in the motel system, in other kinds of ways. And there, helping them is requires one set of skills and one set of social service options. Then we have people who suffer from chronic mental health issues, from substance use disorder that oftentimes is a means of treating those chronic mental health issues uh, by, you know, in their own way. Uh, and who also are often a locus of crime and commit crimes and disorder issues because of those two uh, sort of co-occurring uh, medical conditions, substance use and mental health. Uh, and those folks are the ones who are the most pressing in our public sphere. They're the ones we notice the most. They're the ones who cause the most uh, consternation. They're responsible for a good number of our bike thefts. Uh, they are responsible for the open air drug use that makes our public areas less uh, conducive to having other people use those public spaces. And it's a different kind of homelessness than the 200. I don't think that we have 200 people living in that way. I think it's probably closer to 40 or 50 living in that way. <clears throat> Other questions or reflections? So, uh, I'm Ethan Fleming. I'm with the University of Vermont Student Government Association. Uh, is there anything you would recommend we provide for students on campus and students off campus as public safety resources so that they know, like, when they go downtown, how to engage in a safe way and in a healthy way, both with the city and a whole, and also with uh, people in crisis? Great question, uh, and I, I don't want to. I don't want to answer every, que every question. Um, uh, I think there are tools like that. Um, we have some on our our website. I don't see a lot of issues with students actually running into those kinds of issues most of yeah. the time. Um, I think students do sort of know how to engage with folks. If somebody's in crisis, I think you need to call and seek you know uh, assistance from street outreach, from the police, uh, from fire. Um, but uh, with regard to being, you know, safe in, in the community, um, many of these issues are not issues that have necessarily, certainly property crime affects students, like it affects anybody in the same, bike theft is a big one. Uh, and it's a wake up call to leave whichever community you're coming here from and have your bike on a semi-secured, uh, you know, back of your car and suddenly come out as you've unloaded the rest of your stuff in the dorm and find it gone. That's awful. And it doesn't leave a good taste in people's mouth about our community or our city. Um, that affects everybody. Uh, however, the, the notion of actual you know, uh, safety, I don't believe that that's something that's tremendously uh, likely to, to, to harm our college student population. Um, but I understand that it is out there and there's concerns about it. 
Um, I think that uh, there are, you know, there's probably an opportunity there for us to try to create those kinds of resources and figure out if there's, a, you know, a training or or a community meeting. The, uh, I'll certainly pull it a plug for the community academy and say that we'd love to have uh, students attend that. Um, but that's probably an opportunity for us. Other folks want to um, add to the response to that question? Okay. Other questions or reflect? Oh, I see somebody online. Um, Becky. Hi, Becky. There we go. Um, I had a question about the um, if you have an, a sense of how many uh, families are unhoused and um, I, cause I, I don't see that too often, but I imagine that they're out there and is, are there a special, what's happening with those folks? I know that I, I don't have uh, a sense of that. Uh, typically the folks we see are, um, individuals. Um, I'm sure there are families that are on house. Again, I think that'd be a question for Sarah Russell. Um, it's something that I would imagine that she's tracking. We certainly run into couples. Uh, occasionally there will be individuals who have a child with them, but those aren't generally long-term. Those are sort of folks who appear in a moment and then, uh, disappear either as they find other sources of housing or, or move to other communities. Those aren't folks who are sort of long-term, uh, people who live, uh, unhoused part of the time, but are in Burlington most of the time. And the information by... I'm sorry, I was just getting that this might help because I was going to ask you, Karen, you brought up the number 200 and then Chief Mira, you mentioned it too. Are those 200 like not in even temporary situations in Chittenden County? So 200 homeless people. Or are we counting people who are housed in cots and in hotels and doubling up? And because I think that's like in the school district, obviously, we know we have homeless families. Yes. And, um, the vast majority of those are living indoors somewhere. Once in a while, we have people living in cars, but usually we are able to fix that pretty quickly. And so I just to clarify that number 200, what is that referring to? That's a terrific question. And uh, both Lacey Smith, who runs our uh, community support liaison team, yep. or Sarah Russell would both be folks who could answer that better than I. I do believe that it includes all. And I believe that it includes, therefore, people who are at COTS, who are at the hotels. Um, I think the number would be a lot larger if, if it didn't. Um, but as I said, I do think that, you know, there's a distinction between the folks who are there unhoused and that we're trying to find permanent housing right. for them. Right, right, right. Um, but they are nevertheless currently housed. Um, and, and, you know, the kinds of fa the families that, that you're talking about who are in the school system, those are in that first cohort I talked about right. that are are in some ways invisible to us in a, in a good way in that they're not causing, uh, they're not bringing attention to problems in the, in the public sphere, but not hopefully invisible in a way that we're not catching because we want to know about people that are in that right. condition. We don't want a young student who's houselessness situation we don't know because then we can't address it or help them. So then, the, and then you mentioned the number, and you were estimating like 40 or 50 people, I think. Um, is that folks living outdoors right now? Right now, yes. Yeah. Um, and, and some of that living outdoors, we will see they won't be living outdoors when the weather changes. They will find ways to either, you know, uh, to, to move in with friends, relatives, abide by rules that they sometimes don't otherwise wish to yeah. or, or that are very difficult for them for a variety of reasons. Uh, sometimes living out is... I hesitate to, word, to use the word of choice. It makes it sound like it's something that is almost uh, something that's sort of capricious. Um, but there is an element of other options, but this is the one that I'm, I'm taking right now. Yeah, yeah I'm, I'm wondering if anyone can speak to the Howard Center that Silas is you have any sense of what the breakdown is and what kind of programs there might be or responses are available when Narcan is an option? Well, um, xylazine is definitely in the community. It's, it's... So for those of us who maybe aren't well enough informed, can you start by explaining the question a little bit? Well, uh, I think you're asking about xylazine, which is a force tranquilizer, I believe, that uh, is being added to street drugs. Um, and it's just, it's an add-on that's inexpensive and 
honestly, folks don't even know that that it's in their drug. Um, it causes sores and skin failures, honestly, on a lot of folks. And um, I know we're seeing a lot of xylazine um, injury in the community. We're doing handing out a lot of bandaging, um, things like that. So, um, the other part of your question. I'm just wondering what, like, are there uh, awareness campaigns or testing? Uh, so there are xylazine that? test strips okay. that people can have. When we hand out uh, Narcan Leave Behind kits, they typically have xylazine test strips in them. Okay. Um, and we are actually working to get test strips alone so that folks just want test strips that we can hand them out. But uh, we are getting xylazine and um, fentanyl test strips along with these those Narcan Leave Behind kits. One of the things that for, for those watching or other people in the room, one of the things she, she mentioned that you mentioned is the idea that, that Narcan doesn't work on xylazine. So Narcan is an opioid inhibitor. It's actually called an opioid reuptake inhibitor. It basically prevents somebody who's overdosed on an opioid from having that opioid continue to do what it was designed to do, which is to go into certain receptors in your body and, and make you high. If the if the uh, if the Narcan is there, it actually blocks those receptors, and the high goes away. It can return if the dose was was sufficient, but in most cases, it reverses overdose if the source of the overdose was an opioid, so whether that's a synthetic opioid like fentanyl, which is the primary one that's available in the marketplace now, or heroin, or even if it were true opium, which simply doesn't exist, but obviously it was something that once upon a time, uh, you know, a hundred years ago was was out there. Uh, Narcan works to reverse that. If the overdose is being caused by a polydrug cocktail, which is often the case, um, it includes uh, any, any number of things, many of which the user does not know are there, uh, then the Narcan becomes potentially less effective. And then that is a concern for us. Scott, I wonder if you yeah. have anything. Over there. No, I mean, to touch upon it, I mean, I would really stress the fact that you, the way you phrased your question said for people for whom naloxone isn't an option, I want to stress that. In any suspected overdose situation, you are still using Narcan 100% of the time and calling uh, EMS of the doing rescue breathing, but you're not going to see in street drugs or it, yeah, in street drugs, you're not going to see xylazine on its own right here in Vermont. It's going to be involved with opioids. And while xylazine is a different sedative that can complicate that, that doesn't, it doesn't remove the efficacy of naloxone entirely. So I just really emphasize that that's still very much a role. And I know people have left xylazine conversations thinking like, oh, well, naloxone doesn't work anymore. And that's the last takeaway we want people to have. Thank you. Great. Um, <clears throat> other folks? Other questions or comments? Al? Yeah, so this is a similar question to the one asked by the UVM student. But um, what can we as community members do? And, you know, I, over time, have had different thoughts. And I don't know if any of these are effective or, you know, should be done. But one is to learn how to use Narcan and potentially carry it. Two would be, you know, um, you know what about trying to pick up needles if we see them or find ways to dispose of them, you know, three is how do we just, you know, help out the community? I heard Victor say, you know, students feeling um, threatened as they walk by places, you know, is there, you know, other things for the community to do to possibly just be more on the streets? And partly why I asked too is I have a couple different places that I'm often where there are, you know, people who, as it was described, potentially make me nervous, also make me very um, you know, feel sad that the situation is as it is. But, you know, I have an office that's in an alley that we often have um, needles in. I um, work at a school that has a playground that we do needle sweeps every day uh, and try to find ways actually to discourage folks from showing up on these playgrounds. So I, you know, I'm kind of asking, you know, what, you know, what are some other things we can do? What are those things that you've heard from me are effective? And, you know, maybe there's things I'm not, I'm sure there's things I'm not thinking about that could, you know, help within the community as a, you know, just as somebody who lives here and wants to keep part of this and doesn't, and, and wants to keep trying to make it better without just, you know, causing more problems. That's it. Thanks. 
There is a, a city service C click fix. If you know what that is, um, if you do see needles or um, you know if, if you've seen them in, in the community, you can use C click fix, and we do have uh, folks in the city that will uh, work to clean them up. Um, picking up needles on your own is. I mean, I understand why you'd want to. Just getting rid of them, it's just it's it's dangerous to pick them up, and it's it's they're not easy to get rid of. So um, I would recommend um, using C click fix as your first um, <clears throat> resource for needles. There are instructions on the Vermont DMH, I believe, website, the Department of Mental Health, uh, that that has instructions for how to pick up needles um, safely. Uh, and I think we had a link to that as well at one point at the Burlington the Police Department webpage. But Chief Lachance is, is right. I don't know that that's people should feel comfortable doing that. They should be you know cognizant of it. We have workers um, and employees who have gotten stuck uh, with needles uh, in in attempting to both pick them up and in dealing with people who have hidden needles on their person. Um, and it's. It's it, it occasions a you know you've got a couple of weeks sometimes of taking treatment or worrying am I going to find some kind of, of untoward result from this medically and that's that's no fun. Uh, so I'll just emphasize that um, needle injuries are concerning and possibly dangerous. Needle sticks are handling a needle is not. Um, and if unless you are stuck, it is not a medical situation to encounter a needle. But I know there's a lot of like apprehension about what is the effect or what is potentially caught or transmitted by picking up a needle itself. I know when working with Parks and Rec, we get a lot of feedback on needle stick injuries that occur from improper needle disposal. But these are needles that aren't seen on the street, but like thrown away in garbage bags and then poking out the side. And then that's something that's really hard to present. I also want to say that while if you ever experience a needle stick injury, you always go to the emergency room. The chance of you getting any bloodborne disease from a needle that was found out in the field is incredibly low, less than um, I think the prevalence from academic studies suggests that the rules of threes, you're, you're looking at a less than 1% chance of catching anything. Of, of anything, and that assumes the the highest um, period of transferability. So thinking that, yes, it's most dangerous if someone had just used, had a bloodborne th disease themselves, and then discarded that needle. If you picked up that needle within 30 seconds and stuck yourself, that's your highest period of um, catching anything. Just the odds are just so incredibly low. That's not to say you wouldn't seek out um, medical attention to healthcare, but I just want people to have an accurate assessment of the risk they face because certainly picking up needles yourself is is an option, not an onus we'd ever want to put on the general community. We need better, more comprehensive responses for safe disposal, but at the same time, you shouldn't feel scared, especially at the prospect of, you know, that's a needle that someone else might not see and then step on, and then they have a needle stake injury. So that's all. <clears throat> The only other thing I wanted to just mention is um, there there are there are groups of citizens who do um, oftentimes accompany parks and rec employees in helping to clean up encampments, um, and oftentimes when they do that, they're doing that with camp um, with encampments that I imagine Lacey and others at BPD have determined are abandoned, um, so no one is living there. And once they've determined that, then we go about trying to clean them up. Um, there was one uh, that I went to uh, uh, about a month ago um, that is just over, just over the wall going down Battery Street, and it is in a very, very steep area. Um, we were there for, I don't know, probably about four hours um, when we left with the bags that we had taken out. I don't know that you would have known that if you saw what the encampment looked like when we left, you probably wouldn't have known that we had been there. There's There was just so, so much, so many items, um, just an amazing amount of, of, of items that were in this encampment. Um, it is incredibly difficult work. Um, the people who do this work deserve, you know, just 
all of our first responders just deserve a, a, you know, like a huge debt of gratitude. You couldn't couldn't say enough to see that the work, the kind of work that they do. And uh, um, but there are there are groups of of residents who do go and do this work. They don't do it alone, and I wouldn't encourage you to do it alone. Uh, we we went with I think there was an urban park ranger and there were two parks and rec employees that did this. Um, so if there is if you have an interest in doing that, um, let me know. I'm sure we can put you in touch with people that um, uh, that that you could do this with. Are there needle disposal sites? There are. Uh, there are, some of the parks have them. Um, there's one I know of for sure in Battery Park in the center near where the, there's a sort of a circular seating area. Um, and they're in other places as well. Bathroom, yeah. Yeah. In I mean, I'm just asking this. I mean, I pick them up on my street yeah. because mm -hmm. it's worse mm -hmm. to have a little kid pick them up. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I'm picking them up carefully. On that point, I mean, Alan, Alan mentioned there's needle sweeps in playgrounds and things like that. And you can imagine people hang out on playgrounds late at night and there's not many lights. Um, how, what's the, is there a comprehensive response to that? I mean, kind of addressing playgrounds in particular where they're thinking kids, because adults can generally avoid these things, you know, but kids don't know necessarily better if they're little. So Sea Creek Fix, which Chief Chance mentioned, uh, will generally report that out to uh, its code, right? Or is it DPW that goes? Um, uh, but for something that is found in a playground, that can be reported to police, and police will respond if if available. Okay. Um, the the availability is going to be predicated on on that priority response plan that we have in place, and that's dictated by the number of officers that are that are on the shift and, and available for that kind of response. A needle, even in a playground, is not going to be necessarily a priority one. We don't have a single code for it either. It would probably be I'd have to think of what what that would be dispatched as by dispatch, but yeah. You know, there just to follow that. Um, are, there, are there any regular sweeps done of the playgrounds, or is it more relying on citizens to see this stuff and report it? We do them in the schools. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Our custodians, we needed to train them to do this. We're doing sweeps for both people sleeping there, stuff they've discarded at needles. Um, in the old North End downtown, the Edmonds campus. Um, and yeah, those are the those are the areas. Boys and girls in King Street Center also do it for playgrounds that are either on their grounds or in proximity. Um, but another, but a playground such as, for example, the one in Oak Ledge, right? The, the wonderful new uh, all access playground that's been created. Um, one of the only in the in the Northeast, I think. Uh, you know, I don't know that, that there's a, a specific parks plan to go and do that. I know that it happens when when parks employees go. But is there like a sweep? I don't know the answer to that. That would be a part of the Yeah, the only thing I know in terms of, I don't know about the sweeps. I know that in terms of encampments, if they, they are prioritizing, you know, addressing encampments in the order of the first that are, the, the first that are uh, addressed are ones that are near playgrounds. Okay. Um, there is a, it, it, I won't, I won't go into all of the issues about sheltering on public lands and the and the policy that we have regarding sheltering on public lands and what gets done first and what is allowed and what isn't allowed and all of that. But the 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 Parks and Rec Department is so really overwhelmed with so many that their first priority is those that are around playgrounds for obvious reasons. Thank you. So I just just had a thought. See, click fix. Um, so I've, I've been in tech for a while. And the thing I always talk about is meet people where they are. So instead of uh, relying on people to know about C-Click Fix, have we considered maybe having QR codes at different places? Because people are always carrying their phones to say, hey, if you see a problem, and then they have a quick shortcut to get to that. Good idea. Yeah. And then based on the QR code, you could also have it uh, have the location baked in. Yeah, so it's like see an issue, yeah. click on that. That's right. Brings you to the sequence. You got it. Yeah. That's one of the advantages of the community forums that we're going to be having <laughs> is that since since the community forums were announced there, I, I can't tell you how many people have come up to me and said, you know, obviously you're braver. Some people will actually say, well, I've had this idea, but I don't think it'll work. <laughs> I'm like, well, I don't even know if it'll work because you haven't told me the idea yet. But the reality is that there's a lot of there's a lot of ideas like that out there. And as a community, we really need to come together and find them. And a lot of them don't really cost very much money. Yeah. Um, that is something that it's a great idea. Um, we should do it. Yeah. Karen, I just heard you say community forums. Yeah. 
those are the ones that we're going to be in December, December 13th and 14th. One of them will be in Contoy. So I think the one on the third, on the 14th, the 13th, I, I, we're still working on the location, but we will have two of them. Okay. So I think that's actually also a good part of the answer to Alan's broader question mm -hmm. of what can we be doing mm -hmm. is show up at the community forum. Yes. We hope you will. <laughs> okay. And um, just to touch on your point about you know, sweeps and things like that. Um, Ted Miles from the Code Enforcement Office goes out every single day of the week and picks up 100 needles at all of these different locations. There's it's wild. heroes out there doing this work. Um, and he's always kind of, at, he, he's down at the Department of Public Works building. And um, he actually helped us train our custodians and like, what's an easy way to do this? Because we're you know, you can fill a needle container in one day sometimes. So um, he kind of has the, the easy approach of using a Gatorade bottle, which is super strong plastic, and putting it on the ground so that it's sideways and popping a needle in there and closing the lid. And um, it, it's an easy, quick way of getting it into a trash receptacle that then won't get in the, you know someone's hand. But um, there are ways where if you see one, and you know, see click fix as an option or you just want to deal with it. Yeah. It is pretty safe. Yeah. Um, our custodians are doing it every day down at our buildings and things. So um, it is just a matter of looking at the resources that can kind of give you those safe tips around doing it. So, yeah. I, I would just say the one advantage of empowering the community to self-report is it'll give you the data. Yeah. You'll see if there's a higher incidence of, of there we go. And that is that yeah. Mm -hmm. Sure. Yeah. There you go. Nick, are you guys having um, uh, needles and uh, people sleeping in the garage down on, what is that, Maple? Yeah, Maple and King. Yeah. Yeah, it's kind of a public garage, but it's yeah. under our building. Yeah. Um, mm -hmm. And so Ted sweeps through there daily too, and then we sweep through. Um, our custodians are there every day, and yeah, yeah we're, we're dealing with it. That's my running route. So often at 6 a.m. I see people coming out of there. I'm like, yep. did you park your car? So I don't think you said that. <laughs> nah, nah. And we've done a lot of um, crime prevention by environmental design kind of work, adding lighting, yep. um, putting up, you know, window cages so there's less yep. places to hang out, changing heat ducts and stuff. But you know, we're just we're just managing at this point. I want to know that uh there's a question online about C click fix. Uh Sarah asks, we've used C click fix on several occasions and never saw resolve. Where do those requests land and how often are they checked? <clears throat> well that's probably the best question person to answer that is probably the ward. Yeah. Um, who's not here. Um, but I I my guess is that they're checked I mean, often. Ted checks daily. Yes. I can't I can't verify how often he closes out reports. If anything, I think in the last Comstat meeting he was able to attend, he indicated that he was so busy he was just focusing on picking up the needles as opposed to closing out the reports. Mm -hmm. Um which of course is incomplete data, but he's a one man hero operation. So what else can we ask of him? Um but yeah, so it, they are getting addressed. They are getting seen. Um, and certainly if you notice something after, you know, if the needle remains after making a report for more than one day, please do reach out to me or Ted Miles for more information. We'll get someone out there. Thanks, Scott. Sarah, I hope that answered your question. Um, Sarah, can I ask you a question? I know you were, um, you sponsored the, the resolution that was passed. Would you mind just giving a quick overview of what that means? Because we've heard some discussion around how tight resources are and how you know teams are overwhelmed, which they absolutely are. Is there any opportunity to increase resources for those um, groups or teams you know, as a result of the resolution? To increase, well, the I mean, the, the resolution had resolve clauses. Mm -hmm. One of the main resolve clauses was to, um, well, there were, I mean, there were a number of them. There was a request to get more data from the Chittenden County State's Attorney. I think there's a lot of concern out there of, you know, there's there there's a lot of cases that um, some of them are on back are backlogged. Some of them, I my understanding from the State's Attorney is that there are some that are still backlogged due to the fact that the courts were closed for. I know it sounds like a long time ago, but it, and it was a long time ago. They were closed for two years. Um, that there was still a backlog. 
from COVID. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, so there, there was a request for more data because people are looking for more data. I mean, you talk about data, everybody wants to know about, you know, like on a daily basis, Chief Lachance could tell you how many overdose cases they have responded to. Um, it's pretty amazing. They they have all of that data. And so a lot of people are looking for greater transparency. Um, then there were the community forums. Um, there was also a request. Um, I think there were, there were a couple of them. I don't remember them off the top of my head, but the, as far as the, um, uh, as far as the community forums, those were the re resolve clause was that the community safety committee, uh, the public safety committee, together with representatives from police, fire, um, uh, the schools, um, health officials, harm reduction, um, reductionists would all get together to form these community forums. And then what the, the ideas that come as a result of them, those would then be funneled to the administration. They would go to the the department that was most closely able to address that. And the best example of, of a of that of the of ideas coming and being able to be implemented, although it came from the firefighters, is the crisis response team. And that night on the on the 10th, we heard we actually it was a great meeting because we heard a 30 or so minute um, presentation from the drug crimes unit. They did you proud. It was a it was a it was a wonderful a wonderful uh, presentation, and I think we all learned a lot. Then we had the um, the resolution, and then we heard from uh, the crisis response team, which already has gathered. Um, I don't know. You probably know as of yesterday exactly what the what the response was, which has been great. Uh, my understanding is it's been it's 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 a valuable it's a pilot, and in six months we're going to have to reevaluate or reevaluate before we get to the six months, but. Hopefully, the the goal will be if it's a successful program that we figure out how to fund it. Right now, it's being funded with opioid settlement money, mm -hmm. and it's overtime. It's voluntary overtime. We cannot do that indefinitely. Um, so there will have to be decisions made um, and going into the budget for the next year. Yeah, one thing I've I've said from the beginning is it, we want the data to see if it's a useful program. If it's yeah. if it's not solving anything for us, then we need to do something different. Let's not. You know, so uh, it is early, um, but from what I'm gathering from our folks, uh, in, in two weeks, we've been on, I think, 50 of uh, 55 initial 911 calls that it's responded to, but it has a, a much larger impact than that. Um, they are going into these areas of, of homelessness and drug use, and they're actually, they are reaching out to folks. On um, the first week, they handed out, I think, 68 Narcan Lee behind kids. One thing we're seeing, or this group is seeing, is there is evidence of those kits being used. Mm. You know, when we talk about 422 overdoses so far this year, I think Chief Murad would, would agree, we're only seeing a piece of those. There's a lot of folks that are taking these Narcan Lee behind kits and they're using um, and I think that in, in the communities, there's a lot of folks that are overdosing that we don't even see. Um, and again, there's there's evidence of those kits being used. So I don't think we're handing them out. And they're ending up in a drunk, junk drawer at somebody's house. Yeah. I think they're being used. So, you know. As an indicator of that, the my fellow police chiefs around the county tell me that they are not seeing the increase in overdose that we have seen. We've seen, you know, more than double the number of overdoses uh, in in 2023 that we saw in 2022 and 2022 was an abysmal year an awful year we're not seeing that in other communities overdose for us is not a fatality it's an indication of the person displaying signs of having overdosed on a drug and then generally it means that we actually are able to either intercede or the person revives or or the person is transported to the hospital a fatality is different what we are seeing however very sadly and terribly is that the fatalities are up in the rest of the county more than they are up in Burlington. Thank God we're not seeing a commensurate increase in fatalities that we have seen in overdose, right? We, we're not seeing double the number of fatalities or, or triple the number of fatalities this year compared to say 2021, although the number of overdoses is probably close to that, if not more. Um, but the other parts of the county are seeing their death numbers uptick a little bit more as a rate from previous years than we, and yet they're not seeing the overdoses. What that says to me is that our overdoses are far more public. 
They are being driven yeah. by, uh, yeah. the, the response is being driven by people noticing them and people notice them because they are out in the public sphere. And, and it's, it's somebody on a park bench, it's somebody on the green belt, on the, you know, on the, on the green belt as, as people drive by saying, oh gosh, uh, that person, I just drove by, but they looked like they were in really bad shape. Can you tell me what was really happening? No, I'm not even there anymore. That doesn't happen in Richmond or in, in other parts of, you know, in Williston, for example. But those folks are suffering the same way. And I don't think the rates are any different there than they are in our community. It's just done in, in secret. But even some of ours, as the chief says, are in secret as well. We're not seeing all of them. We've got another question online um, from Catherine Anthony. She notes that Iceland implemented a scientifically proven drug prevention model. 10 years later, their need for substance abuse treatment for men from 20 to 25 went down by half. And in addition, crime significantly declined as well as sexual violence decreased. So Catherine asks if we can revisit investing in a serious way in a scientifically proven substance misuse prevention plan for Burlington. Um, Karen, I'm gonna, not, I, I, I don't know who can answer that question, but I'll just start with you because, um, you know, I, I do remember, I think comes, it, it does, although I, I have to say, I mean, I've had this conversation with Catherine a long time ago about the Iceland model. I don't know, Scott, you're probably more familiar with it. I, I don't remember. I know that it started very young. It, there was it, it had its roots in like early in childhood education, I believe, and in um, after school programs that they seriously, significantly invested in. But you probably remember all of the the more the particulars. I I don't, especially with Catherine on the call or online. I definitely don't want to misspeak about that. That is my understanding, yes. my recollection. I will say, as a member of both the Misuse Prevention Council and the Settlement Advisory Committee. The Settlement Advisory Committee, one of the first like 13 tasks we are asked to allocate funds for is the prevention of opioid overdose deaths. And at a time where death is higher than ever, it's certainly hard to make the necessary investments we need um, in prevention modeling just because the situation and the need for treatment and harm reduction is so dire. That's not to say we'll never get to the point, but when weighing um, funding opportunities to be supported by settlement dollars, I know as an individual member of the committee, I'm drawn to first look at how do we keep people alive? Um, how do we keep people alive and then help them live a better life and a life that requires um, all less of the many traumatic experiences that go hand in hand with living with uh, insufficiently treated substance use disorder. So it's not to say that that's not something the state might look at in the future, but thinking about this next fiscal year and how we'll make recommendations related to, I think, $15 million. Um, I, I, I couldn't say that the Icelandic model is something that is going to be on the agenda this fiscal year. Anybody else want to add to that? If I had a dollar for every... If I, had a dollar, if I had a dollar for every time I had a good idea for funding um, that came to me that I had to say, um, you should get that dollar, um, that I had to say not right now, unfortunately, um, even in thinking about $15 million, that isn't enough to do everything that we can readily say we need to do to uh, improve public health and public safety in our communities. Other questions or comments? A very broad question, which is just where does housing fit into this? Um, it seems like that's another, you know, maybe long-term investment that's not necessarily as pressing um, as the immediate need for help. I'm wondering if that is uh, at all, like what initiatives are there, where, where people are going to live? I would say it's definitely as pressing. Um, just because houselessness, housing insecurity increases someone who's living with substance use disorders odds of experiencing mortality. I think that housing insecurity and homelessness is also often an on-ramp to substance use disorder, especially when that coincides with a poorly treated mental health condition that wasn't substance use disorder to begin with. So when thinking about reducing mortality, oh, and finally, the third point is um, 
it's really hard to um, get into treatment or get into recovery when you don't have stable asthma. Like it's next to impossible. Um, it's impossible. So um, looking at settlement funding opportunities for this next year, I know that we're going to be relying on some recommendations from the Chittenden County Homeless Alliance to really see what we can do to build um, not just congregate shelter, but uh, temporary permanent housing for people who either need short-term stabilization to make themselves eligible for other housing programs, or just, again, to get people in safe spaces. Um, but no, I, I would say it's, it's just as pressing when talking about the ways in which we can reduce mortality. We need to make sure people are housed. We did try um, on Cherry Street to use the, um, the the state office building. We had made a proposal, as you may have heard, um, for uh, for for housing there, and I believe it was fifty to sixty people that could have been there. It was obviously there was a cost with that, and so we were, we applied for a, a grant from the state. We were denied that. the um, The state came back and uh, said that they didn't feel our our housing our our need was that great. And so we we weren't we 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 weren't able to secure that. We had we did respond to that, and I mean honestly, I mean Sarah Russell wrote an amazing letter. Um, uh, and uh, you know, as of as of now, that is just not happening. Um, but that would have been at least a, a part of a solution. I mean, the reality is that there is no, you know, one of the one of the reasons why this challenge is so difficult is because you know it's 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 individual people. And individual circumstances, and the way that we're going to get out, get get to a place where people are living, is by by get by literally, as you were asking about, are people are we are we do we know who these people are? And I think to a large degree we are we do. Um, some of them will be in housing in the winter, and that will be an opportunity to to know who who they are, what their individual circumstances are, and hopefully that will be a way for us to be able to secure some place for them. Um, when it gets warmer out um but it is a it's a it's a constant challenge challenge the uh, sarah russell is amazing um she was hired to be the special assistant to end homelessness and uh fortunately she still has a job mm. karen who denied at the state level that funding um, building you mentioned so the letter was sent to the secretary of the agency of human services um that was who, I don't know if that was that person, but it was done through that agency. Okay. I've got a follow-up question actually related to that, which is um, you've all talked about various community partners in all of this work that you're doing. And, and one organization that I didn't hear identified, and I'm kind of curious in light of this last question, is Champlain Housing Trust. And um, just curious how how the city works with Champlain Housing Trust and and um, uh, you know if they're part of this process and, and part of the solution. Well, CHD is running and, and managing the pods on Elmwood. So uh, on Elmwood, uh, just north of uh, Pearl Street, there is a uh, a, a, a little. It's, it's on a former parking lot, but it's a small village of pods. These are, are single occupancy, uh, tiny homes, uh, and people who are, were unhoused are currently housed in there. Um, they have uh, rules that they have to follow in order to live there, uh, but it's uh, a, um, for the folks who are inside and the, the folks who've been able to, to stay to those rules, it's been, I think, a great success, uh, and they are, are better off for it. It hasn't been uh, all uh, successful entirely for the neighborhood that it's in, because although the folks who are inside the pods are are not really are, are obeying rules and and uh, doing the best they can to get back on their feet with the social services that can now connect with them in one single place in a, in a much more sort of efficient way. Uh, other folks who aren't housed but are associated with these uh, individuals uh, who sometimes either buy. We believe there's some narcotics transactions that are happening there uh, and in the vicinity, and that causes a lot of disorder in the immediate area. And that disorder is very troubling and unfair to the neighbors around it. Uh, the neighbors are experiencing real problems with that. 
Um, but it's it, there. There's a balance there that is going on. And in the net, uh, it is a, a a program that is is good. It was put together. I think it would have been much more impactful for us if we hadn't been simultaneously inundated by a much larger homeless population that we really didn't anticipate, expect, or had ever experienced. And so, uh, once upon a time, the idea of getting 30 people housed would have been a big chunk of our, uh, you know, the the sort of obtrusive, and I don't mean that in, in a pejorative way, but the, the noticeable component of the housing population, of the unhoused population that is out in the public sphere. Uh, getting 30 into these pods would have been a really big deal. Now it feels a little bit like a drop in the bucket, um, and, and that's unfortunate. Well, in fact, that's a, that you raise a good point, and that is that when the pods were first planned, we this was way before the release of 800 people from the motels that happened in June. And so when that plan came forward, I think that was the idea. I think we thought that that was going to be a significant, that that was going to be a significant victory in terms of uh, housing people that had nowhere, who were unhoused. Um, it just didn't work out that way. So I, I do have a question, or it's rather it's a statement. There are some things, as you just alluded to, um, that were just out of our control. Um, Fentanyl, xylazine, out of our control. Um, we had a known um, unhoused population uh, that the, that were displaced. I guess my question for all of us is, when did we know the uh, pandemic funds were running out and that the motel program would end? You know, this isn't just a real question. Uh, we didn't anticipate the onslaught of folks, but as one of the key cities in our state, whether it's Burlington or Brattleboro that have resources, it seemed like a natural consequence of what would happen. So I'm just asking for us as a community to lift our heads up a little bit more. And unfortunately we didn't anticipate it happening, but it did. So I guess on reflection, when could we have known? When could we have done what? That, there were that, that the program was ending and that there was no contingency plan for those folks who were going to be unhoused. I think that question is probably one that's best to uh, someone in the legislature. Yeah. They were the ones that, you know, that was that was, that was was not a Burlington decision. I mean, they, the motels were costing, my understanding is we're costing about $20 million a month. And it became an unsustainable okay. amount of money. Uh, there probably were some inefficiencies there. Um, and, uh, when that decision, why, when, when that was known, I honestly don't know the answer. I don't know, perhaps either one of you might know when that actually became known. Um, I, know. I don't know, the, you know, <laughs> you don't know. No, I mean, I was just going to back you up to yeah. say, I think that if you ask people in the legislature or in the governor's administration, you're going to get differing answers on, um, when we could have known, it seems like speaking for myself, myself only, stepping away from everybody, um, <laughs> that uh, there might have been an information asymmetry that might have resulted from some negotiations maybe not taking place in good faith, that, that maybe more could have been done, or maybe there could have been more transparency about that this Band-Aid is being ripped off soon. But for whatever reason, that messaging wasn't wasn't clear until we were caught in a state of near emergency with the amount of people released on the street. So. There was phasing to it. Uh, I know that, that Lacey Smith was uh, paying very close attention to the, the timeline. Uh, the phasing was, uh, at first there was a date and then there was pushback and that date changed and then there was a phased date. Uh, and it was known that we were going to face an increase. I don't think we anticipated how large an increase by any means. I don't know that we really could have. I think there was an exacerbating factor too, which which the kind of polling that you're talking about or census taking rather that you're talking about might be able to address for us in, in, a, in a known way. But we, we presume that we've gotten a number of people because of flooding. Yeah. The floods yeah. of the summer exacerbated yeah. the problem in ways that we could not anticipate, and that we're dealing with folks who otherwise would be addressing their needs in communities from which they come, like uh, Barrie, like uh, Montpelier, like, you know, maybe even as far south as Ludlow and other places. But we don't know that. And, and that is the kind of information that I do think a census might assist us with. I don't know how much data we get out of a census when we're still talking about a relatively tight population of 200. There's not 
uh, you know, sometimes the small numbers like that make it difficult to sort of draw pictures of, well, X number are, you know, uh, you know, studied at the Sorbonne and X number uh, did this or that in some ways that, that allow us to, to say, well, now we can really hone in on on whether or not, uh, you know, uh, neoclassical French studies is a way for us to make connections with these folks. Um, I, I think not knowing exactly when those dates were coming and then having it exacerbated by a completely unanticipated yep. environmental event uh, was was definitely a factor in, in what we're facing. But the, the truth of the matter is that we, you know, there, this, was a, this was a situation that was in fact, uh, addressed during the pandemic, the, the specific problem of houselessness was greatly diminished because we housed people mm -hmm. for a very long time, but we did it in a way that was not sustainable. And, and although yep. we can yep. uh, believe that, that more could have been done at the Montpelier level, um, both the executive or legislative side, although we can say that, you know, maybe there were inefficiencies, as you say, uh, Councilor, Pre Councilor President Paul, uh, the fact of the matter is that, that it wasn't sustainable, not monetarily and not without the huge influx of federal dollars. And who knows where federal money comes from? I mean, it, it just kind of comes. Um, but state money doesn't. State money has to come from all of us. And we don't have the money to do that at the state level, even the state levels. Could we need? Do we need more assistance from the state in Burlington? Absolutely. Mm -hmm. um, but is is there money to be had? That's a very open question. This is a tremendously expensive problem if we really want to address it. And we haven't even touched on the parts that are public safety crime issues, and we don't have the resources for that right now. And so, for us to actually address all these things is we 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 have deep desires to make these kinds of fixes. And I don't believe that our actual wherewithal is commensurate with those desires. I mean, clearly, if we had known in advance, think about what what would twenty million dollars a month buy us? How many how many how many motels could we have bought? Could the state have bought that were not really functioning that well? Could they have bought to house people if we had had if we could if we could like sort of freeze time? be able to catch up by a couple of months, be able to do all of that infrastructure, think of how different things would be. But we didn't have that opportunity. Mm -hmm. So I think that is, uh, but I agree with you. For all the things that we would love to see, you know, there, there, is only so, there is only so much. And I, the way that I look at it is that, you know, we could all, there's, there's plenty of finger pointing that could happen about things that, mistakes that were made or inefficiencies that were created. None of those are going to solve the situation that we have now. And we need to, I, it's just my opinion that we need to not be doing that, but be focusing on all of us working. No one competing against each other. We don't need to be competing against other municipalities. Rutland has per capita a worse homelessness problem than the, than the city of Burlington. There are, there are people all over the state in need. We need to not compete against one another, but find a common solution. Um, or we're never, or, or that is the way for us to really yeah. resolve this. Yeah, I will just say for me, it's not about finger pointing at all. No, I didn't mean that. Okay, yeah, yeah. For me, it's, you know, it's like any sort of postmortem. Is there something we could have done better? Mm -hmm. Well, and lessons learned. Exactly. Yes. I, I will um, summarize a comment that Karen has that's up there that I don't think anybody can read in that small thing. But basically, um, Karen, your point about, you know, what could we do with that $20 million if we hadn't spent it on that? Catherine is making the point that we need to find money for prevention mm -hmm. um, because that will save, you know, mm -hmm. because those are the better those are investments. long term fixes. Right. That's the point that she's making, um, and I'll share the exact comment that she made with, with folks on the panel later. Um, Nancy um, also uh, wanted to go back to the question about the state building, and um, Nancy asks, what do we need to do to get the state building? This is a big deal. So I guess the question is, maybe put differently, is there anything that could be done? Is that still a, a possibility? I just saw an article yesterday, I think, and it had a picture of the building on Cherry Street and said $29 million state loan to get it. There may be no answer for <laughs> I, I don't know the answer to that. I know that we made the proposal. My guess, and again, it's really a guess, is that that grant funding went to 
something else. That would be my guess, but I don't know for sure. Yeah. I would have to find out, but that would be my guess. It was a finite amount of time and I believe it probably went somewhere else. Yeah. Are there other uh, questions? Yeah. I've heard comments from people who don't, aren't necessarily interested in know that people are attracted to come to Vermont and to Bronx in particular from other places because of the generous welfare benefits, whatever we have. You know. And I don't know if there's any truth to that. I, don't know that. I wondered if any of you could shed any light. The majority of the people with whom we interact are people who've been in Burlington for quite some time. How did they originally come? I don't know. I, I think that to a certain extent that is a little overstated. Again, the census that you proposed would probably be a, a good way to to get to drill into that. Uh, I do believe that there is truth to the idea that if you want more of something, you subsidize it. And we have subsidized a lot of different kinds of social services. Um, and that does create an impact. I, I don't I, I, I think that is something that is uh, a, a challenge we have to reckon with. Um, and, and that is a way of thinking, you know, as we think about long term, what we're going to do or not as a community. But in the immediate moment, we have these needs, particularly as, as winter draws closer, uh, that we, irrespective of how people got here or, or why they got here or where they came from, we need to be able to, to keep these folks safe. They're in this community now. Uh, many of them are going to be endangered by the shift in the weather. And, and what are we going to do about that? But the majority of the people with whom we as police deal on a day-to-day on -day basis, particularly around that disorder, the people who are, are strongly in the second cohort of homelessness that I talked about, those are folks that are, uh, they're, they're Vermonters. They're from Vermont. They're here now. Uh, you know, I mean, we're, we're a state where if you, weren't, if you weren't born here, or even if you were born here, but you went away for 20 years and came back, you're still not really a Vermonter. So uh, who knows what that means to be a, a Vermonter? Uh, but these are folks who are are here, right? They're not they're not folks who just got off a bus because they were living in in uh, Charlotte, North Carolina, or in Burlington has a really good uh, the, the pods on Elmwood are really swell. And the climate's I don't. And I don't. There that too. Yeah, I don't think there's much research, if any, to really affirm that uh, houseless populations have significant migratory patterns based on social services, but there has been research to affirm that if there are good social services, you're less likely to leave. But in terms of that being a motivating factor that's going to get you somewhere, that's probably not the case. I think I think that is, I mean, the, the information that I've gotten when we, in, in the work that Sarah has done to try to document is, does, does prove that out, at least from what we know, that the people who are unhoused are not people that have come here from far distances, um, you know. Maybe as far as barriers. I mean, some, yeah. <laughs> yeah, I but mean, they're- Some, some, yes, of course, there's probably a small percentage, but by, it's it's a misnomer that these are the vast majority of people that have come here seeking services um, because they've heard that Burlington is, you know, offers offers services or Vermont does. Okay. I think there's another hand over here. Yeah. <laughs> Getting back to excuse me, the survey idea again, I think if you just ask three questions, you know, where did you grow up? How long have you been in Burlington and why did you come here? If that information showed, for instance, that there were a lot of people here from outside of Chittenden County, what can you do with that information? You can take it to the legislature and say, look, we got a lot of people in Burlington asking for services that didn't grow up here. We're happy to do it. It makes some sense. There's a you know, the benefit of scale and all that, but we need some help. So that's a good question. I'm, I don't know if the, one of the three of you know, when we do the point in time count, which is done in January, are those questions asked? Um, so the point in time count is when we do a at a point in time and it's done in January. I don't know if those questions are asked, but I think that raises certainly is as, as, is is a good point. Well, certainly, if, if folks are not, if they didn't grow up here, investing in Burlington and an Icelandic prevention model wouldn't make a lot of sense because that's not a problem. So I, I agree. I've been yeah. thinking that ever since you spoke up, I think there's, I think it's probably more than three questions. There's probably ten, um, sure. and um, it's a relatively small number of people. Mm -hmm. I mean, actually, it, it, it should not be that hard. So no, I think that's an excellent point. Where did you, you know, where did you grow up, and how long did you, you know? Yeah, I think my, 
I, my bigger view is that if this is a statewide problem and Burlington just happens to end up, you know, as a home for most of it, it's not going to be solved by Burlington ever, ever. It's going to have have to be solved in some of the other communities. And if not, which is probably not, that's why they're here, state's going to have to get involved in a much more substantial way than they are now. Yeah, I, I've been thinking about that myself that whether you're Burlington or Brattleboro or Rutland, um, any city is going to be a draw for people. If you're a gay person, you're going to be drawn to the city. If you're someone who is of any other, I'm here, okay? Let me just say that. I check a lot of boxes. So there's a definite reason why I live in Burlington. And the same can be said for folks who are homeless and seeking services or seeking community because they are homeless. And maybe you don't have really a great community in, I don't know, Westford, but you have one in Burlington. So I think having more of a municipal countywide, to your point, let's talk economies of scale. Burlington and in Chittenden County and Winooski and Colchester and Essex and Shelburne and all of our communities in our county, where our people are moving in and out all the time. We live in one place, we work in another place. Burlington should not be shouldering this alone. And we are. So if there is a way to fund it and say, listen, let's have economies of scale as far as the cost of these services, but also shared resources. One thing we also know is true is right now we have a revolving door for folks. If we get them in the treatment, how long are they there for? Is it 12 weeks? That's not long enough. You're kicking someone back to the circumstances that had them in distress in the first place. And people tend to go back to whatever their community may be. And in this circumstance, it may be a community that keeps them in to a substance abuse state, not family that maybe could lift them out of it. There are other things that are out of our control that we in Burlington and Vermont had no control over. In the 80s, uh, mental health facilities, boom, gone. And we saw a spike in homelessness, right? We have no control over that. But if we as from a federal standpoint and a state standpoint, start really focusing on how do we build back mental health institutions or mental health hospitals so people can get treatment for more than 12 weeks, let's say 18 months, drug treatment, again, for 18 months. And when they come out, they have the wraparound services and way to be supported. Right now, we don't have anything in place to support anyone. From a law perspective, I bet y'all are feeling handcuffed mm -hmm. by choices that were made down in Montpelier that you have no control over. And it's, it, it's this holistic approach we're gonna have to take a look at because yes, we can say we're gonna be reactive right now to the situation that we're facing, but that's not gonna get us out of it. So we can be reactive and I appreciate exactly what you're trying to do, Chief Lachance with your CRT units, because we can't have our first responders burnt out. We can't have our healthcare workers in the ER burnt out. We can't have our law enforcement people burnt out. And then we're gonna have to work as you've created your own plan too, Karen, to have these, you know, we're saying short-term, next and long-term strategic plans. And that's gonna mean we need Governor Scott involved and we're gonna need the legislature involved. And we really are going to have to cooperate and coordinate with our surrounding neighbors and towns. And then I'll stop talking. But it it is it is that it's not it's not going to be easy. But the only way we're going to find ourselves out of it is if we really do dedicate ourselves to some sort of solution. Because I will say this: it's not going away. Well, Ever since human beings learned to gather, they've been dull in the pain. And that. That's something that I know Chief Murad and I see on a daily basis is police and fire services are reactive services. We're yes. not solving the problem, unfortunately, as much as we'd like to. Um, you know, when you call for that person on the park bench and you have this great feeling that I just solved the problem, uh, you did. That's right. We, we went there and we might have solved the acute issue, um, but it's not solving it long term for that person. And I agree that we, we're really good at step one. Yeah. Right. We're great at step one, but yeah. beyond step one is where we struggle. We just stay in this loop of step one. 
and it's frustrating for responders, honestly, yeah. because you just don't feel like you're having enough of an impact. I think it's about time for us to wrap up, but I wonder if any of our um, invited guests have any closing words or thoughts that they want to leave us with besides making sure that we show up on December 13th and 14th. <laughs> Anything else that any of you would like to share? Just thank you for thank you for having this because I think it is I think people what I hear from most is that people want to talk about this they really want to gather and be able to talk about this in a, in a way that is non confrontational um, and just a way of just expressing their concerns for the struggles that we're facing so that's if you want to talk about the first step that's probably the first step um, is is being able to understand what the what the challenges are. And then we can find the solution. So thank you for having well, us. And likewise, I want to thank, on behalf of the Ward 60, I want to thank each of you for showing up and sharing your work and sharing your thoughts um, and for all that you do and juggling all the responsibilities that you have. We recognize how much this is to ask and we really do appreciate it. And I also want to thank community members for showing up because it does, I think, need to be a community-wide conversation. Um, and I also want to thank Champlain College for hosting us. Yes. Thank you. And I think we can call this meeting adjourned. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.